Thank you all for coming. My name is Scarlett Aldabaugh Green. I'm a senior policy analyst at New America Foundation. Uh, well, now New America. Um, and I really appreciate those of you that were able to make it with the snow cancellations um, last week. Um, and our um, guests who were able to fly despite reschedules and, and all of that. So uh, we're very excited to have our guests here today. Um, I'm going to introduce them first and then do a little bit of an introduction um, on the topic uh, generally and then Andrew's going to talk about the report um, that you all hopefully had the opportunity to pick up outside. If not, feel free to take a copy on your way out. Um, so our first panelist um, it will be Andrew Weiner. Uh, he is a senior immigrant immigration policy analyst with Bread for the World Institute. Andrew has more than 15 years of experience working on immigration issues in the U.S. and in Latin America. Andrew's research and writing on immigration has appeared in a wide range of publications, including peer-reviewed journals like International Migration and on other media such as the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times. Uh, Betty Garcia has lived in Iowa for over 20 years. She is a native of Mexico who has spent most of her life in the United States. Uh, Betty assists her parents, the owners of Tortilleria Sonora, um, operate their small business. Tortilleria Sonora began 20 years ago in the family's home and is now a fully staffed production facility in Des Moines. Um, they have clients ranging from local restaurants to grocery chains and um, to food service distributors. Uh, Rod Castillo is the executive director of the Suazo Center for Business Development and Entrepreneurship. He is passionate, a passionate advocate for the Latino community and believes that education is the key to the economic success. And then lastly, Amelia Lobo is uh, passionate about helping Iowans create wealth for themselves, their families, and their communities through small business ownership. She is the director of small business programs at Ice Adventures. Um, she's a 26 year, it's a 26 year old Iowa nonprofit that is the Iowa leader in working with women, minorities, and low income clients um, as they launch small businesses. Uh, so generally, I was very excited uh, when Andrew contacted me about this topic. I think that um, right now in the U.S. we're really at a critical sort of social and uh, economic juncture where uh, we have had a lot of um, economic duress, particularly in minority communities and immigrant communities. Um, and the recovery has really, um, it's been slow and it has very much um, can be measured along sort of ethnic um, and racial lines. So minority communities generally, including immigrant communities, have not recovered wealth um, or access to wealth as quickly as uh, white communities. Um, so this event um, really kind of seeks to explore how immigrant um, entrepreneurship and small businesses can improve um, the situation, the economic situation for their local communities um, in terms of poverty reduction and in terms of just broader economic growth. And so um, I was really interested in looking at immigration from sort of a different lens than it is typically um, looked at. So not necessarily as a problem, but actually as a solution. Um, Andrew will quote far more uh, stats um, from the report that he has been writing um, in collaboration with these folks and others. Um, but essentially, um, there's just a wealth of uh, small business owners who are non-native-born uh, native uh, people in the U.S. Um, as probably most of you know, uh, the vast majority of um, immigrant families are of mixed status, and so there is there are a lot of sort of social and economic dynamics at play. Um, there are significant barriers that affect the ability of um, small business owners who are immigrants um, and, and especially those who are foreign language speakers to access uh, wealth and to access um, economic opportunity. And so Andrew will talk about that. Um, and our idea is essentially that if you remove some of those barriers, um, then you can actually see families um, and local communities um, reap the benefits of sort of an infrastructure that is already there and a group of people that are already sort of working um, to grow businesses or to start businesses um, and in a potential that has been there uh, for a very long time. Um, and in many ways, this is sort of the history of America, right? Um, and so we're sort of looking at what that looks like in the next 20 to 25 years. So without further ado, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to say, um, first of all, thanks to all of you for being out here. I know the, the weather's been pretty bad today. It's a little better. And so I uh, appreciate you uh, coming out <coughs> and being here to, to participate in this. I um, also want to say thanks to uh, the New, New America and particularly to Scarlett. Scarlett, um, you know, in addition to uh, helping organize the panel and, and um, 
the space. She actually provided a lot of sort of analytical and research guidance into the report and it definitely helped improve the, the quality of the report. I hope you all were able to pick up a copy of that. So I just want to, you know, I want to talk briefly at the beginning to sort of frame, uh, going a little bit more in depth about what Scarlett talked about, sort of frame, you know, why we did this research, what the goals were, and how it fits into sort of, uh, you know, sort of a, a broader, broader context. So there's a lot of ways to look at this issue. Um, uh, it, you know, it involves immigration policy, asset building, financial education, economics, entrepreneurship. It's, it's not, uh, doesn't inv involve just one policy or one issue. It's inter interdisciplinary and cross-cutting. But I think, you know, working uh, at, at Bread for the World Institute, our focus is on poverty reduction. Um, and I'm an immigration analyst, so that's sort of the, the angle that we took. We, we look at it, uh, in particular, uh, of the U recent U.S. recession that's been very long and very deep and, and, and slow to, uh, it's been very uh, slow for the economy to emerge from the, de from the recession. So we're looking at ways that immigration policy could uh, help, help provide dynamism to the economy to help uh, reduce poverty and help uh, inject economic activity and economic growth um, uh, to help reduce, uh, lessen the impact of the recession or to leave it quicker, which I think just now, the, you know, the economy started to grow at a faster pace after, after many years. Um, so one way to do that is to look at entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm just going to cite a couple other reports that sort of fed into this. In, in May 2014, the Brookings Institution had a report called uh, Declining Business Dynamism in the United States. And um, that focused on how entrepreneurs, uh, this is just one example, entrepreneurs are key. Entrepreneurship is key to business dynamism and the creation, growth, and expansion of businesses um, is important to sustained economic growth and job creation. This is sort of the the creative destruction of capitalism that's been, you know, a big part of the U.S. economy and that drives, um, drives economic growth, uh, you know, for, for a long time in the United States. Uh, historically, in the United States, uh, one business is born every minute, uh, while another business fails every 80 seconds. So that gives a sense of the, the sort of the churn of small businesses and how that, you know, feeds into you know, that creates a dynamic economic environment. People are trying ideas, getting out there, growing their businesses, testing it in the market, hiring employees, selling goods, and that's, that's a way that uh, entrepreneurship contributes to the economy broadly. But the report I mentioned earlier, it's sort of main finding, and there's a lot of other research out there <coughs> talking about this, is that over time, over the past few decades, U.S. business formation has been on the decline. So, um, and, and that's affecting the pace of job creation. Job creation goes up and down, and obviously there's a lot of variables, a lot of factors that feed into job creation. But over the long term, entrepreneurship in America, which is really part of American culture and even part of American sort of uh, national myth, the entrepreneur, is, is on the decline. <clears throat> and so I don't want to you know, talk too much about the report, but one of their key findings, uh, uh, recommendations and key findings in the report, and I'll quote here, they said that perhaps the best and most immediately effective way for the federal government to ensure a more dynamic economy is to significantly expand the number of immigrant entrepreneurs granted work visas to enter and remain in the country. So this report, and among many others, in the context of you know a, 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 what was a stagnant economy and declining entrepreneurship broadly in the United States, one of the major recommendations is to support immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, and there's been some attention to, there's growing attention to immigrant entrepreneurship. Typically, this is among um, STEM entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, you know, Silicon Valley, focusing on science, technology, engineering, and math. We hear a lot about Google. We hear about, a lot about Yahoo, which have, I think, um, immigrant entrepreneurs either as co-founders or founders. Um, so those get a lot of attention. Politicians talk about them. Policymakers talk about them. And, and supporting them, there's, there's a general sort of consensus, I think, in supporting those type of entrepreneurs. But in our report, we're, we wanted to focus more on small business owners. Um, the corner store owner, the restaurateur, the person who owns a landscaping business or a translation company, they also make a contribution to the economy. They also help, uh, they also hire people, they also contribute to local economic dynamism. So we wanted to focus on them because they're often less out, left out. People want to focus on the billionaires and millionaires in Silicon Valley a lot of times, and that's important, but there's also the small immigrant entrepreneurs that, um, uh, that make an impact. So this is, you know, this report's part of a growing, a growing body of research on small immigrant entrepreneurship. Um, <coughs> recent findings, one report by the Fiscal Policy Institute, 
found that uh, Im small immigrant entrepreneurs uh, owned businesses generated $776 billion in business, act business activity and sustained 4.7 million employees, 14% of all people employed by uh, US small business owners. And it's also been proven that immigrants uh, have a higher propensity for, uh, for entrepreneurship. About immigrants, the foreign born, are about 13% of the total US population. They're about 16% of the labor force and they're about 18% of all small business owners. So they're overrepresented as immigrant entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurs. So given all this data and these statistics, um, we take the potential, uh, based on the other research out there, the potential of Im small immigrant entrepreneurs to contribute uh, to the economy to help reduce poverty and to uh, contribute economic dynamism. We sort of take that as a given. What this project did, what we did with the report, and what you know, I'm hoping we can explore, explore a little in, in the panel and the discussion today, and as, as Scarlett mentioned, is so what, what are the barriers to small immigrant entrepreneurs? And, and we did that focused on three diverse field research sites, two of which are, are represented uh, here today on the panel and which folks will talk about. We focused on Miami, Florida, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, and so the goal was to ascertain the challenges that small in immigrant entrepreneurs face in these three communities and find the, the sort of overlap and the commonalities in each of the three sites uh, to identify the barriers, but also to identify some of the promising practices and the people who are supporting small immigrant entrepreneurs to help immigrant entrepreneurs contribute better to their, to their local economy. So government, we talk to people in government, nonprofit, academia, and the private sector on what they see as the barriers and what they're doing to address the barriers to small immigrant entrepreneurs. So this study, is, this report's very much locally focused. It was done over, uh, pretty much over 2014. We talked to, interviewed 78 people in, in each of the three sites. So again, I'm not gonna go, uh, go into too much detail of the report, but just to sort of I, to talk about some of the findings um, uh, here up front, some of the major barriers we found. Uh, there were four major barriers we found across sites, um, identified by uh, people in, in all sites. Um, that was uh, lack of access to finance, uh, lack of opportunities for business education and skills, language and culture, and immigration status. <coughs> and I should say, you know, the, uh, being an entrepreneur in, in entrepreneur in general is difficult. I think most businesses act actually fail, whether they're, uh, whether they're foreign born or um, US, US born uh, um, business owners. And so some of the barriers are also true for US business owners. They're maybe not unique to foreign born, but they're maybe more intense for um, some of the barriers. Access to finance is a problem for everybody, but for immigrants, it's even a more intense barrier. And some of the barriers are unique to immigrant entrepreneurs, for example. Immigration status is something that a US born entrepreneur, for example, um, just would not have, have to deal with. So to, to wrap up sort of the, the, the um, <coughs> Opening, opening remarks. Um, immigrant entrepreneurs do face unique barriers. And in spite of being a big part of the local economy um, and having um, you know, uh, the potential to, to help uh, uh, revitalize local economies, they face unique barriers. But they don't receive a lot of unique uh, support, at least from the federal government. One example of this, if you think about federal agencies that might help um, uh, small immigrant entrepreneurs, the uh, Small Business Administration uh, may come to mind. And so if you look, you know, you do, I took a look at the Small Business Administration, that's one thing we looked at. And they do a lot of research on, on immigrant entrepreneurs and, and they definitely tout the, the potential of immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, and it's very pro-immigrant entrepreneurs in terms of uh, rhetoric. Um, but in terms of their budget and programming, you'd be very hard pressed to find any sort of uh, SBA programming for immigrant entrepreneurs. That was, you know, I found that across sites, there's very little uh, programming or funding available. Um, one example, and you can find this online, if you look, uh, they, if you look at their uh, budget request, the SBA budget request, or the bud Congressional Budget Justification and Performance Review for 2015. Again, this is easily, you can easily find this online. Uh, they requested from Congress, this is where different agencies put out, you know, what they've done in programming, what they've achieved, uh, what they want to achieve in the coming year, sort of justifying the funding for their agency. Uh, in 2015, they requested uh, $710 million for, for its SBA funding. And their, their, their quest is, was 132 pages long. And so if you go in the report, you know, they're dealing with a lot of different issues and groups. So if you go in the report, the word women is mentioned 79 times. So, you know, a big thing the SBA does is work with like, you know, female-owned businesses. That's a big, important thing they do. If you look at minority, 
Uh, it's mentioned 14 times. That's another one. Rural, they, they have special programs dealing with rural businesses, and, and that's mentioned 11 times. If you look for the word immigrant in the 132-page document, you'll find it zero times. So immigrants, totally not mentioned, even though they're, they're, uh, uh, they employ 14% of all people in the small business sector. Immigrants in the SBA sort of real request to Congress when it talks about money and programming, that's a good sort of example of what it finds important. Um, it's really nowhere to be found. And I know it's easy to criticize, and I know the SBA faces lots of political pressures and budgetary pressures, but you know, when there's a group that's employing 14% of all people in the small business sector and they're getting no mention from the SBA, you know, part of this report and part of the recommendations we have is that it's, you know, things may be a little bit out of balance in terms of federal government attention to this, to this group. So finally, you know, to kind of bring it up to the present moment, uh, and why I think this is, you know, a good moment to talk about this, um, is the, uh, the DAPA program announced by, by uh, um, President Obama in 2014 the Deferred Action for Parental Arrivals, which, you know, I, I know that's in the courts and that's in Congress and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, I think eventually that's going to be implemented and uh, you'll have four or five million people who are going to be able to get work permits and be able to um, get sort of a quasi-legalization -legaliz eventually at some point. Um, and thousands of them are, are, are entrepreneurs. Maybe some of them are entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs now, but they're not able to expand because they're working under the table. Many others may be aspiring entrepreneurs, but they maybe haven't, you know, um, taken it up because of fear, because of their undocumented status. So this is a great time for um, this program, which also includes a White House task force for new Americans, um, which brings together different agencies to sort of integrate these people who are, are getting this deferred, uh, this deferred status and getting work permits to have a piece of that specifically dedicated to immigrant entrepreneurs, to engage the specific unique needs of immigrant entrepreneurs so that they can be more successful and contribute more um, successfully to their communities. And this is still something in progress, so I thought this, this would be a good time to, to talk about this issue. So I think I'll, um, I'll stop there. That's a, that's a quick summary, but uh, uh, look forward to the to questions and, and discussion. Okay, so Betty will tell us a little bit about sort of her perspective from as an immigrant entrepreneur herself. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Scarlett and Andrew for having us here. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to voice um, our opinion and, and our thoughts. Um, well, we came into this country in 1984, and um, my mom came to visit her sister um, to Des Moines, Iowa. She absolutely loved the place and said, I'm not going back. So we followed. Um, my mom was working as um, a housekeeper. My father was working at a meatpacking plant. Um, during 1993, the floods came um, in Des Moines, Iowa, and it caused my dad's um, company to close. So we moved to Texas, where we have family. Um, there wasn't a good tortilla there. So um, we started working out of our home. In our, um, in our living room, actually. While people had um, couches and TV sets, we had little industrial machines. We had no idea what we were doing, so um, we all pitched in. There's four of us, there's four kids. And um, we you know, helped everything from flipping. It was very manual work. We packaged them with a little twisty tie, put on a sticker, and my dad would take them in milk crates to the local Piggly Wiggly. So that's kind of how we, we, we started there. Um, then we moved back to Des Moines, Iowa. And um, they managed to get a little storefront. Um, we got a little bit more updated machinery and start supply to some of the local grocery stores there. Um, some of the issues that we came across was, you know, a grocery store would say, where's your barcode? And we were like, what's a barcode? And my dad, Betty, figured it out. I'm like, okay, you know, um, what about the nutritional facts? You know, oh, well, you need that in order to sell it at a retail. You know, it's no longer the little Piggly Wiggly, you know, town store anymore. So um, we've, you know, my father has an eighth grade education and my mother has a third grade education. So language was a, a huge obstacle. You know, um, I'm the oldest of four, so they depended on me quite a bit to 
do the translating from you know trying to get a loan or how do we get a rental space or um, shipping you know equipment where do we get bags from um, you know little things like that so um, it, it was definitely you know a, a struggle um, the other thing is, you know, fear of growth. You know, um, once you start getting really busy, are, are you doing things well? You know, the city comes and inspects it, but, you know, do you really understand what they want from you? Um, I was always in the middle, always kind of had my hand in, in the business, even though I had, you know, another a regular job. And, um, you know, things like, my mom would call me and say, Betty, the phone line's not working. Oh, okay, let me get on that, mom, you know? Um, my dad would say, you know, we don't have internet, why? Well, I don't know, dad, you know? <laughs> let me go over there and check it out, you know? So um, when I first came into the business full-time, um, my mom was keeping a calendar. She, she had a little calendar, kept track of the invoices, who bought how much, and what grocery store owed us. But it was all written down in this calendar. So um, it was very not updated, for better lack of words, you know. But they tried. They, you know, they showed us, you know, hard work pays off. You know, today we have um, a fully functional um, manufacturing tortilla plant that uh, we have nine employees. Um, we just obtained a um, private label contract, and um, so there's more growth there. Um, that's exactly what we needed, you know, um, to employ more people, to update our equipment. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. Um, the bank has been one of our biggest fans. You know, building relationships with, with people is definitely a must. And it's me, you know, because my parents, even though they do know how to speak some English, it's, you know, my dad says, well, when business is doing well, I'm the owner. But if it's not doing well, you're the owner, meaning me. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do have um, just our, the cultural, cultural differences. Um, I'll give you an example. We, um, one of our distributors for um, food service, required or wanted some wraps from us, which to us is kind of foreign because who has flavors in their tortillas, you know? And my dad's like, oh, it's, no one's gonna like that, no one's gonna like that, you know? And I'm like, all the people like it, we just don't like it, you know? And it's one of the biggest, you know, our biggest sellers, you know, today. So, um, so you know, little things like that. Um, just the difference of the culture, the background, and um, trying to obtain you know, financing. We are at this point that we're going to have this growth spur, is going to be growing pains, you know, and um, I'm excited. My dad's a little bit freaked out about it, um, but, it's, but it's exciting, you know, and how do you obtain, you know, just, your financing, you know, what's the next step? You, um, today I know a little bit more than, you know, my parents did, and I'm a huge help, but for somebody that doesn't speak the language, you know, we didn't know anything from barcodes to the nutritional facts to how do you get your materials, and, you know, you have to make a product that's going to be long-lasting on the shelf, you know. If you don't put preservatives in it, it's going to expire within a week. So, you know, there's a lot of little factors that go into it. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're up. So maybe from a macro level, um, what are some of the uh, issues that you encounter? And, and well, you know, listen to uh, Betty's story. It's very um, common to see that with uh, entrepreneurs that just come to this country and they have lots of questions. And uh, you know, one of the things that we believe and we're very strong is about the education. Uh, what she has experienced, it can be accelerated by having classes, having mentors, and uh, you know, giving the heads up to entrepreneurs to say, this is what you're going to need. Not only in the part of business, like creating a business plan, 
which most uh, lending institutions will ask, but also, you know, what are the uh, legal implications of certain certain kind of food, or what uh, are the city requirements, what are the state requirements. There's a lot to learn. And when you look into that, and then you also understand that there is a barrier of communication, of language, it makes it almost impossible. So one of the things that we do in Salt Lake City, we started with a nonprofit organization, it's called the Pete Swasso Business Center, and we help about 350 to one year, we even have up to 600 businesses that we help um, in all sort of uh, aspects, whether it is marketing, whether it is lending, whether it is uh, uh, <clears throat> human resources. Uh, there's a lot of challenges for entrepreneur. And it's interesting that now the city, I mean, the, the, the colleges and universities are making a difference between teaching business and teaching entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship it demands a lot. You have to be a little bit of a lawyer, a little bit of a salesman, an administrator, et cetera. And uh, we are aware of that. And so the Pete Swasso Business Center, we teach classes in the evenings from six to nine, because we are conscious that most of the immigrants are working very hard, whether they have one or two jobs, sometimes up to three jobs to support their families. Um, and yes, we are asking them to come to classes in the evenings when they're tired and learning all this uh, uh, theory. But as you know, you can go to a school, learn the theory, and then how do you apply it? And that's the key to it, is that we have mentoring. And so we have experts that we help them through the day, to the entrepreneur, to apply those concepts, that theory that they learned in the evenings. And it has worked quite well. We have, you know, one of the most important factors that I would like uh, legislature to consider is that when you look at an entrepreneur, whether it's local or foreign, born, come uh, start a business in this country, and if he has the education of entrepreneurship education, he can create a job, and I am going to quote one that is a lady from Mexico who started seven years ago, um, struggled to get a loan and uh, was turned down from many, many business uh, banks. Uh, we helped her develop the business plan. She got a loan today, actually two years ago when I talked to her and I got her, uh, her numbers. She has revenues of over $50 million. She has over 350 employees. And if you consider 350 employees that they have families, that's 350 households being supported by one little lady that started you know, five years ago, seven years ago now. So if you multiply by all the entrepreneurs, and a lot of the, uh, the people that come to this country, they come with this dream of having a better life, and they're willing to learn, they are able to learn, all what they need is a place, a way to have that education. And we do it in a very uh, layman terms, very easy. In less than three months, you can see that they start changing from asking us how to do it to conversing and talking with us and dialoguing about what do you think about this? This is what my solution. And they really start becoming entrepreneurs and being responsible for their own businesses. So my uh, plea, my uh, passion really it is, it is about education. Education, meaning not as a formal education in university, which is very important, and everybody should strive to get that. But what happened to the ones that can't? What happened to the ones that don't have the time or the money? We need more organizations that are nonprofit, dedicated to help them, and particularly and a mentor one-on-one -on -one to enable them to be entrepreneurs and to at the end, we all are going to benefit. You know, the economic impact that we have done just as in Salt Lake City. Imagine that. I mean, 300 businesses services every year, 150 to 160 new LLCs or corporate created every year. Um, the, you know, quantization of that impact, economic impact to our local economy, it is substantial. And I think 
we can do more. We can do more in other states. We can do more even in Salt Lake. And uh, that's my message. Uh, I, I, I could be talking more and more, but I, I guess we'll have the opportunity to, uh, to answer some questions. And uh, last but not least, I do want to thank you for inviting us and Andrew for spearheading this investigation and this um, study. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot that we can do. And thanks for your time. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Andrew, first for your visit in Des Moines, uh, and also to Scarlett for having us here. Um, so I run the small business programs in an organization that uh, actually is transitioning in terms of its name right now from ISED Ventures to the Iowa Center for Economic Success. And we have a number of small business programs. Our agency is actually statewide with, uh, I guess I would say, boots on the ground in Des Moines and in rural Southeast Iowa. And so I, one of our big challenges in Iowa is that uh, Iowa is um, largely, though not as rural as, you, as most people might think. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to get um, services into those rural areas. And I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to meet both of you, and especially to hear your story, Betty, because her story is very uh, typical of a, what a lot of our clients experience, uh, with the caveat that her family, you've been in business for a very long time, and obviously the level of success is much higher than, than um, what our clients have experienced so far. Uh, but just you know, in terms of Iowa, although we think of Iowa as being a very white state, uh, in fact, Iowa basically owes all of its population growth to immigration. Uh, by 2040, it will be about 12% Latino. Uh, it also has other substantial immigrant populations, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, East African, and such. Um, now, particularly when we think about the Latino population, but all of our immigrant populations, they are younger, um, poor uh, folks. And so entrepreneurship is really a really important avenue for those families to grow assets. And we're in an asset building organization, which basically means that we are striving to help people exit poverty by growing assets. Uh, you know, a really interesting thing, I think, is not only do entrepreneurs have uh, higher incomes than their counterparts, uh, but also when we look at, you know, past that first generation, studies indicate that entrepreneurs are more likely to invest in their own children's actually formal education. Uh, so it's, it's a very typical story. You know, you, you have an entrepreneur or an immigrant who comes to the States and has a third grade and eighth grade education, and uh, they, but their kids are more likely to finish high school and go to college, et cetera. And so by making investments in the entrepreneurs, in essence, we're also making investments in their, their kids and their, their kids' ability really to, to earn exponentially more income than, than even they have um, as business owners. Our programs, um, we, like I said, we're in Des Moines. Uh, until very recently, all of our programs were completely in English. And that's something that we've really tried to change and add more services in Spanish. And so we do, uh, we, we also do night classes. Um, in English and in Spanish, uh, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. twice a week. In fact, we have a session going on right now. Uh, and then we do specialty classes. So we have general business management classes and then specialty classes. Uh, and uh, right now, we're working on rolling out a program specifically geared towards, towards our rural entrepreneurs, uh, which is called Dream Builder. We run a women's business center, and so a lot of our education is actually geared towards women. And Dream Builder is a completely woman-focused online business education platform, uh, which, which has support from our staff. So I'm, and I'm happy to talk more about that as well. Um, and then we also provide mentorship and kind of the connection between the business owner and the state institution or the lending agency or what have you. Um, I think you know one of the big challenges that uh, you know maybe you touched on a little bit 
uh, is actually <coughs> digital literacy. Uh, I truly think that being an entrepreneur probably 50 years ago or 100 years ago uh, perhaps was not so different for a native-born um, resident as a foreign-born resident uh, or somebody with more or less education in the sense that they didn't face these additional hurdles. So for example, our regulatory environment is so much more complicated now than it used to be and certainly than it is in Mexico or Costa Rica where I grew up. Uh, and also, you know, you, you, in order to succeed, you essentially have to be able to, you know, take orders online and, you know, use email and, and do all these things that are very difficult uh, for somebody with, lower, with a low level of education, never mind somebody who's not a native English speaker. Uh, at least in Iowa, and, I'm, and I don't know if this is the case in Utah as well, our state doesn't provide any sort of resources, business resources that are not in English. Uh, and that's a conscious choice on the part of state legislature. Um, so it's very, very difficult for a non-native individual to access those services. And so we really try to bridge that gap. Uh, and I, I would go even further and say that there's definitely an, an issue of cultural competency or a cultural barrier. Uh, and it's hard for our entrepreneurs to reach the state. But I would like to put that on the other side and say there's a lack of cultural competency on the part of our state agencies towards the entrepreneur. And I would say, and I, I, I am paid for by the SBA in part, but I would say also on the part of the SBA. Um, where if I think of my, when I, when I think of my organization as being client driven, I have to think of my organization as being able to respond to my clients' needs. And in order to respond to my clients' needs, I, it's on me to have that competency, right? And I don't see that our state agencies are doing that. Uh, and that's where I think organizations like ours have to come in and provide that bridge um, between the entrepreneur, bet between the individual and the state. Um, so that's one of the things that we really try to do through our educational programs. In addition to our educational programs, we're currently launching a microloan fund, which will be funding of up to $50,000 for um, businesses that are owned by women, uh, individuals with minority status, and individuals with disabilities. Um, and so we're really excited about doing that, and a company uh, like Tortilleria Sonora maybe a couple of years ago might have been a good candidate for that. <laughs> you probably have bigger capital needs now. But, uh, but there are a lot of challenges in that too. You know, we can't lend in the way that a bank lends. Um, and unfortunately, because of our funding, and I think this is a, is a really important point that, that Andrew alluded to, uh, our funding prohibits us from lending this money out to people who are not um, authorized residents. And m a lot of particularly the Latino population in Iowa falls into that group. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a hole that we're not, that, that we're not addressing. And, uh, and so I think we need to really think about what that means and how we can uh, develop the assets to address those issues. Okay. So I think um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then open it up for all of you. Um, one of the questions that I had just, um, you know, reading through the report and, and talking uh, to all you in preparation for this event is um, the underlying sort of and, and somewhat uh, unspoken issue or maybe like we've spoken a little bit about it is um, obviously the barrier of um, immigration or legalization. And um, as you've mentioned, you know, the federal government, Andrew, for example, has um, a lot of imperatives and a lot of um, pressures, and federal agencies have a lot of imperatives and pressures in order to get their full budgets funded um, in what they can or can't fund and how they can discuss uh, a particular issue or how they can't. Um, and, and funders also have um, a lot of those barriers. But I was very interested in kind of exploring a little bit more um, this idea that, you know, because folks are in the country without legal status, um, that we will create a structure and a discourse and a funding um, pathway that explicitly uh, disables them from sort of becoming um, or, or, or being able to achieve economic success 
um, and in a way that we basically, um, as, as for anyone that's been following um, immigration news, um, we can't possibly deport everyone that is in the United States um, without documentation, right? I mean, that's just like a fact. Um, and so what do we lose by literally forcing people to remain in a secondary economic status um, not just the individual, but then also, um, as you were saying, their children. And so I wanted to hear a little bit from you all um, in terms of you know, numbers and, and the research um, and in your specific locality, sort of your take on what is the potential economic loss um, and sort of like long-term loss of, of creating um, this system, even if we're not explicitly doing it um, by failing to kind of recognize the realities of the facts um, in terms of the composition of the United States right now. I don't know who wants to take that like super easy question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me give it a try. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, that there is a challenge, especially with undocumented, is that they are not going to be qualifying for any sort of uh, traditional <coughs> lending institution, right? And even some nonprofits, mm -hmm. they are they're going to be out. Um, and uh, the real problem is, is that, you know, any person that wants a loan, whether it is personal for business, uh, any lending institution are in for the business. So their main drive is to mitigate risk. How do you measure risk? Well, we have a system here that measure risk by having a social security where you have a report. And in that report, it tells you the character, it tells you, tell you a lot of the um, history of the person in terms of finances. And that would exclude almost anyone. And all organizations are looking for where is that good borrower? Where is that A-plus borrower in order for us to mitigate our risk, right? Meaning the lending institution. Yeah, now you're seeing what the issue is. So, so the, other, the, other, the other side of the coin is we got an entrepreneur that has a good business plan. He has the opportunity to have success. And how do you connect that bridge. How do you connect that bridge if someone doesn't have a uh, history uh, of, of financial history that says, yeah, this person could or will repay? Um, there is something that at the center we are doing that is new. It's a new concept. There are some organizations that are getting very interested in it. We are starting, we already started with a pilot of micro lend, uh, a pilot of micro lend program. And the idea is rather than to look for the A plus borrowers is to create a plus borrower, meaning uh, people in poverty, you know, uh, they have less education than most. But given the education and given a program where they can come to, in this case, to our center, learn about business, learn about human resources, learn about personal finances, they become, and we have seen this as the months progresses and they are achieving the, the, their education and they're developing their business, they understand and we can measure now character, which used to be in the traditional sense, a credit score. Now you can measure the character by looking at what they achieve in the education term. Uh, I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but to us it's very exciting because now we can literally help someone get out of poverty into um, applying their own creation, their own business through education. So go back again into education is so important. You know, uh, we can pass laws, we can, we can do all sort of things, try to enforce something, but it's the difference between feeding a man a fish or teach him how to fish. And in all the principles, I think that that's one of the most important ones. Uh, the economic uh, loss that we are seeing today by uh, segregating, by separating, by putting blocks, stumbling blocks to people. I mean, uh, someone was talking about, and I, and I read in the news, that ICE right now it has the power to deport 400,000 people a year. There are over 11.6 million uh, non-documented. So they are to stay. And what are we to do? Education is the solution to help. That otherwise it will create more poverty. It will create more issues, you know, on, on, in terms of needs for food, health, 
et cetera. And what we can do is help them help themselves. And this goes for not just immigrants, but for everyone that is in the situation of low poverty. Uh, and that's my try to the, to the answer. I mean, I guess from the, you know, a, a national policy standpoint, again, I, I would just go back to this, this program, um, the DAPA program, you know, would offer an opportunity for people to, to, to legalize, including in uh, entrepreneurs, or at least to get, get a work permit. So, I mean, they're here, and they want to contribute to their communities. I mean, I understand the debate about the executive action. I think, you know, my own opinion is I, I, I supported it, but I understand that people not liking immigration enforcement to be done through the, through the presidency. I think that's a legitimate point of view, but it's already enacted. The people are here. Um, I'm not sure why you would want to, you know, if they want to contribute to their communities economically, not make it easier for them to do so. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping as this works its way through the courts and once implemented, that, you know, people who are now running their, you know, running a business is difficult enough, as, you know, we've heard from here, I think running your business uh, while you're, you know, under the table, basically, is really challenging. So, I'm hoping through this program, you know, these people can come above board and, um, you know, do more in, in the places where they live with their businesses. If I could also add, I think there's, it, it's so interesting, there's such a big difference between the ways that um, undocumented immigrants are, are treated in specific areas versus other areas. Uh, so, for example, I used to underwrite microloans in New York City. And so in New York City, I had very little fear of my clients being deported. Uh, and going to your point of risk management, if I consider that my clients can easily be deported, I'm probably not going to give them a big loan, right? Um, because I, I also have to protect my portfolio and my ability to continue lending. Um, in Iowa, police are deputized. Uh, so uh, it, it becomes much more likely that if you have something very minor, a mi traffic infraction or a car accident, um, that you can be deported. Um, so it, so the, the, risk ma the risk calculation is, is very different in Iowa from where it would be somewhere like New York City. Um, but I, and I, and the, you know, the other issue is the rhetoric within our own state legislatures, right? Um, and b because I have funding that comes from the state, uh, and there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, immigration within the state, it's much harder for me to be able to use that funding to support uh, those, the businesses owned by undocumented immigrants. However, and I think here the, the big heroes that are, at least I hope, the big heroes that are going to emerge are those that are in cities and towns. Um, cities like Salt Lake City, which I know has been doing a lot of work with immigrants lately, um, but also s much smaller towns. We have a program, a rural program based in, in Southeast Iowa, which is the poorest part of our state. Um, and one of the towns that we work in is a town called Muscatine. Uh, one of our clients there wants to start a business and it will hopefully employ quite a few people. And that town has itself has a small microloan fund and they have signaled that they would be willing to lend him funds to start his business even though they know him to be undocumented and so i think that um this the cities are the ones that are going to emerge as the heroes here and saying the, we know that these individuals are significant contributors to our community and that we want to support them even though we know that there's a risk there so that, I think, is really exciting. And I think as we're able to do a better job with our programs, and, and part of doing our better job with our programs is not only providing the, the services and the education and the microloans to our clients, but also advocating for them uh, in terms of policy, right? Is going to that local newspaper and saying, this business just hired 10 people, and this business is owned by this immigrant. And as we do that, towns like Muscatine, Iowa, uh, like Des Moines, uh, can start thinking more about the opportunities that are provided by immigrants rather than the drawbacks. So that's exciting. Yeah, I think that um, in my reading and also um, in a prior life um, elsewhere, uh, my 
when you get into the sort of the nuances of a locality, people are very clear on kind of what the economic imperative is there, particularly in depressed areas. And so, you know, anyone that can really bring in jobs, <laughs> you know, it's like a great person to have. And so um, I think that you're right that a lot of the dialogue um, is a lot uh, more nuanced at the city level and at the locality level um, because of that. And I'm just going to ask one more question and then open it up. Um, and, and maybe, Betty, also you can kind of talk to this. Um, this idea of poverty reduction through um, entrepreneurship, I think obviously one of um, the barriers that we have identified is the language barrier and another one, um, the immigration barrier, in addition to finance. And so um, in a context where a person may not be able to get a job over the table, in many ways the only way for their family to kind of um, stay afloat um, is through entrepreneurship. And, and that may account for some of the overrepresentation in small business ownership. And so I wanted to maybe ask if you all had some concrete examples of you know where small business entrepreneurship really helped both like a family and then maybe broader in a locality in terms of poverty reduction. Um, yes, of course. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> I well, I, you know, I, that's kind of a. Um, if I may. <laughs> so, you know, in our, we keep a lot of statistics in our center and uh, half of the entrepreneurs in the past have been women. And we started uh, doing a little research of why it was so, or was motivating women to go into business. And uh, in the low and moderate income levels, uh, a lot of uh, the mothers, they have two, three, four uh, children. And when you consider um, a low paying job with the cost of child support, it makes it impossible for them to sustain, almost makes it, makes it worth it not to go to work. It's cheaper. And so, but having a, a small business at home where they can take care of the child, children, and uh, develop, you know, some kind of income. It's, uh, it's a, you know, great, great answer to their uh, financial problems. So I think that's one of them. It's impacted the family tremendously, you know, and now having the opportunity. We even have thought on, on doing it in the, during the day as they take their children to, uh, to, uh, to school and then they have maybe one, two, three hours to come and participate and have a special program for women, whereby we need the you know some at least for younger child to have a, a child care for the mother, but it definitely would impact. I mean, it will break that, that poverty cycle of not being able to get the education or not being able to start the business. Um, and from a personal experience, we um, what I've noticed is the majority of my employees are women, um, and we're not quite there for, as a full-time job for everybody, but because of our business, um, our hours of operations, um, it does help those women that may not be able to have a full-time job because they have you know, two, three, you know, four children, but can contribute to the household. So it's not just the husband, um, or they may be by themselves, but you know, it's not just the husband um, with that whole burden to you know try to get them um, you know ahead or provide. So you know my employees, even though like I said we're not at full time just yet, um, they they benefit from it. You know um, it's a contribution. They feel better. Um, they um, have their own little money uh, for whatever you know they use it for. Um, but they're not just solely depending on their spouse for that support, so. Okay, so um, you want to open it up or folks have questions? Patricia, walk around with the mic. Thanks, hi. Is that on? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, it's so awesome. I'm, I'm Peggy Orchowski. I'm the congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook on Higher Ed which is a very diverse magazine. I cover immigration. I've written two books on it. And um, I cover everybody in Congress. I have to. So I'm equally in good relations with Luis Gutierrez as I am with, with uh, Stephen King. And everybody has a good is point. Is that my Stephen King? That's your Stephen <laughs> King. <laughs> Don't throw up. I mean, you know. No, no. He <laughs> needs to be worked with. <laughs> um, and, and 
you know, I, I've gotten, I'm from California. I came to Washington and I got a really different view. I've spent a lot of time in South America and got a really different view on um, Latino <coughs> immigrants here, well, Puerto Ricans for one thing, but also um, the fact that, that people here, they, they, love, they love Latinos, they love hiring them. Um, I've had extremely liberal Democrats tell me they'll hire a Latino any day over a black, that they that their their work ethic, their friendliness, and all that. We all love the immigrant worker. They're so willing and hardworking and going to sacrifice. And but the problem is, we not everybody can be a first generation immigrant. Not you know, immigration law also has to protect American workers. And the big problem nowadays is is African Americans, and. Here in Washington, the unemployment rate of African Americans is 9%. The Latino unemployment rate, 2.9%. Three times lower. You start getting places like Ferguson. I mean, I'm amazed in Ferguson. All the shops, most of the shops that were burned, they were immigrants who owned them, not blacks. So my question to you is, when you're talking about giving jobs, like your nine employees, how many of them are legally in the country? How many of them are Americans? When we give entrepreneur visas, and I mean investment visas, part of the requirement is that they have to hire Americans or um, legal immigrants. The, the idea is jobs for Americans. You know, If you are funding businesses that only hire family members or people who are here illegally, yes, you're going to get some resistance. So how, how open are your companies, it's your biz, education business, to Americans, to African Americans particularly. We have a real problem with that, and it's a rising problem. I don't know, LA, there's a big problem between blacks and Latinos in the construction business. Here in Washington, 10 years ago, well, so, all the construction so, well, business let me, was Let me blacks. jump in. Yeah, no, that's, um, thank you. That was a very you packed really, question. That would help this resistance to DAPA and everything else, if at least you talk about American unemployment and especially African American. Sure. Um, so let me take uh, that for a minute. So there are a few issues there to unpack. Um, the first one is sort of the tokenization of uh, Latino immigrants as kind of like an ideal race over African Americans, I think is exceedingly problematic. And I won't ask you for any names of who in Congress is involved in that type of discourse, but obviously that is. Um, beyond problematic. Um, I think the the other <laughs> issue um, here to kind of unpack a little bit is kind of this idea of who really is an American and historically what the roots and, and the history of immigration are um, in the country. And certainly I think that if we engage in, in discourse on um, immigration issues and who it is that we are employing specifically and how the economy is growing and then how the people that are being employed are spending money and how that money is funneling back into the economy and then in turn employing other people, there is a ripple effect. And so um, I'm going to let uh, you want to answer that, Rob, but I definitely want to just kind of clarify um, kind of both of those issues that, that were sort of in there a little bit. Right, so I'm so saying. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let the panel. Yes, please. Yeah, go. let me let me take that question just with examples. I have uh, one immigrant that has started a a, a phone call a phone call card that at the end, rather than you know uh, buying and reselling it, um, hired as far as I know right now uh, over ten engineers, all it must be. Uh, not, not political, political correct, right. all white males, you know, uh, engineers graduated from the university from here. Provide citizens of the United States they're white born, males, so they're white, white uh, American born citizens. males from the United States, and you know, however you want to call it. But yeah, I mean, the idea, and that's the idea, is there is an entrepreneur to create, to create a business that can create jobs for everyone. Now, most likely, a small little business. Yeah, sure. They're gonna hire the family. Even even we tell them if you you know in our in our organization say if you're gonna hire family, they better have the skills, or they you better uh, invest 
in your family to have the skills in order to have a successful business. But that's another topic. But yes, yes, the answer, it is yes. And that's why we are so excited about to help immigrants start businesses. Because if they are good um, entrepreneurs, if they are good administrators, they are going to provide jobs for everyone collectively in their community. And so, you know, from high, uh, in my background, by the way, is electronic engineer, uh, they are very well paid. You know, so yes, there is an economic impact that the community is doing. And the larger the business, the more opportunities will be for jobs for everyone. The other story that I told you about, 350 employees. Yeah, you got accountants, you got, you know, marketing, you got all sorts of educated. And yeah, there is not, a, you know, anti-discrimination of saying we're going to hire only immigrants. You have to hire people with the skills. And most likely, those are probably Betty. You right. And, and anyone that comes to me for a job and I have an opening, you know, can you perform the job? Where have you worked before? Um, you know, are you able to meet the requirements um, of our business hours? You know, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, orange, blue, green. But, you but check their immigration so we're we, gonna, uh, you know, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. we are required to, t you know, for them to fill out the their debut not or you know th their paperwork. Um, they have to present, you know, a photo ID, um, and whatever the sheet says, whether it's a social security number card and a an, uh, local photo ID, or you know, um, th that's what I'm required to do. Okay. So, yeah, if I may, my organization is not exclusively Latino uh, serving. So, actually, about 40% of our clients are African American. And that's down from about 70%, not because we choose to serve fewer African Americans, but because we're, we're serving many more Latinas now. I think the history of uh, race and economic inequality in this country is a very complex topic, which is not necessarily a topic that we're tackling today. Um, it definitely intersects. And so I think that, you know, sort of who accesses services and what those services are and how we target the services to the particular communities um, is incredibly important in terms of giving those communities uh, sort of these opportunities. Today we're choosing to talk about immigrants in that context. Um, our program often talks about um, other racial groups in that context. And I don't think it's necessarily productive to kind of pit them against one another. Um, so Patricia, I think someone in the back has a question. Yeah, so yesterday I was at a National League of Cities panel on immigration. 80% of the audience by a show of hands was from towns or cities smaller than 100,000. Could you talk a little bit, if somebody's in a city of fewer than 100,000 people and if they have uh, a desire to support immigrant entrepreneurs in their city, what institutions, should they look at community colleges, should they look at the city's commerce department, or you know, what, what institutions should they look to to help them serve immigrant entrepreneurs better? That is such a great question and such a difficult question to answer. And I would say that we're right there because the cities that, particularly the cities we serve in Eastern Iowa are cities of 50,000 and less. Um, I think, you know, when I talk to a lot of economic development professionals, they really want to provide services to Latinos in particular because they, they have a big influx of Latinos. Uh, but you have, to, you have to actually have the resources to provide those services. So it's not good enough to say, I want to have a Spanish workshop once a year or four times a year, et cetera. And so I think the answer to that is really a combination um, of all of those things. So for example, in Iowa, we have Iowa State University, which is a land grant university, and they have an extension program that has an entrepreneurial development kind of group um, that is really working with Latino entrepreneurs, among others. Uh, nonprofits like ours that are really committed to providing services in at least Spanish. I mean, we would love to provide services in other languages as well. We have an important Burmese population in Iowa. Uh, um, also, we need to have the state agencies really care and understand what they're doing wrong. Um, and, and, but, but generally, I think it's, up, it's, it's really kind of been up to nonprofits. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the funding that a lot of these nonprofits used to receive through programs like Prime, through SBA, um, have gone away. Uh, so th that's a really complex uh, question. I would say one of the big challenges for us in Iowa, at least, is hiring staff 
that both has the interest uh, and the knowledge to work with, uh, with entrepreneurs in general, but with Latino entrepreneurs in particular and provide services in Spanish. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, and maybe Andrew, you can talk a little bit about, about this, it's in the report, um, and even extremely immigrant um, sort of conscious localities, um, like in Florida, um, in Miami specifically, uh, where there's a vast uh, number of Latino immigrants, um, services are not necessarily targeted to other immigrant groups. So actually in uh, Florida, the report focuses on Haitian immigration and Haitian immigrants and entrepreneurs. And so maybe you can talk about what is or isn't there um, in that context. Yeah, I mean, I guess just very briefly, it's, it's a great question. I, you know, it's and I think it varies so much. You know, some of the some of the main organizations that could help could be a community college. It could be sort of an ethnic chamber of commerce. You'd see that, uh, but in a small town, they may not have one. Um, so it it really it really varies. Um, yeah, and so I think in in, in Miami, we focused on actually Haitian immigrants and, and the role of Haitian immigrants, where you have you have a very vibrant uh, 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 immigrant entrepreneurial culture in Miami but it's very it's very dominated by Spanish speakers so there's always you know it's a complex it's a complex issue where you have like a lot of support for Spanish speaking you know Latin American immigrant entrepreneurs the city politically is pretty you know is dominated by by people from uh, you know Latin, Latin American descendants but Haitian entrepreneurs they feel like they're kind of shut out from the English speaking you know business community and the Spanish speaking community so you know there's there's lots of different barriers Maybe one more or two more, Patricia. Hi, um, Chris Alper. I'm from Bloomberg BNA. Um, this question is for Andrew. I'm curious if you could explain um, some of the specific um, policy solutions that you'd like to see the White House undertake to address some of these issues. And i um, also curious if you've heard whether or not they're actually considering any of those policies or other policies uh, in rolling out DAPA whenever that happens. Yeah, so I mean, I guess there's three three basic ones. Um, one would be, you know, which I spoke of, uh, would be sort of like within an organization like the SBA or a new organization <laughs> by the like in the uh, that's like the SBA that targets immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, you know, again, you can it's very reasonable to, to debate how much attention you know should go to immigrant inter, immigrant entrepreneurs versus female business owners and others and none you know more important than the other they're all important but right now i think for, from what i've seen my research there's almost a complete lack of, of targeting of immigrant entrepreneurs so either within the sba or some other <laughs> relevant organization that's created to help immigrant entrepreneurs succeed um, the other one would be you know i think i touched upon it a little bit earlier would be within dapa DAPA brings together this White House Task Force for New Americans, tons of different agencies, you know, to, to help integrate people who are going to be getting this deportation, deferral, and work permits. Again, you know, it's in, entrepreneurs isn't the only thing or necessarily even the most important thing within that, but it should be part of it. A big chunk of these people who are going to be <coughs> uh, getting work permits want to be entrepreneurs. So, and specific services for entrepreneurs, which are discussed in the report, you know, lang and been discussed here on the panel, cultural competency, language, things like that that are targeted specifically to immigrant entrepreneurs. What that looks like, you know, that's that could be created in a variety of different ways, but at least there's something specific, uniquely targeted to immigrant entrepreneurs who are going through through DAPA. And then the last one is, you know, the most controversial one I guess would be, you know, legalization, some sort of broader legalization of of immigrants. I mean, uh, I've, you hear some amazing stories. I was talking with Betty last night. You, you know, it is possible to have a business and be undocumented. It's definitely possible, but it's a big drag and a big hassle and dangerous. Um, so just providing some method of legalization for immigrant entrepreneurs broadly beyond DACA is really going to help them be more successful. Um, you know, obviously not only, uh, not only employees and laborers, but also people who own businesses. It's just going to facilitate their ability to help the communities they live in. So, I mean, I think those, those would probably be like, I don't know if that's as specific as you wanted, but those are three sort of recommendations that, that are in the, re in the report. I think, you know, too, in addition to the SBA, actually a lot of the funding for um, these programs comes from the USDA um, through their Rural Business Enterprise Grant programs. And that's, that's the agency that has been our champion in our rural program. Um, but I would also say things like CDBG funding. I mean, we, and, and Andrew doesn't, directly go to this but like you can't provide these services and not pay for them 
So, you know, we have to decide, are these priorities? And if so, are we willing to invest in, and it's not just about immigrant communities. Are we willing to invest in low-income communities and in the de community development? And personally, I don't see that right now. So bring back CDBG funding is the other one. Anyone else? OK, so do you all want an opportunity to give a few closing remarks? Um, you're okay? I'm okay. happy to talk afterwards if folks want to talk. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation online. Um, this it's, was live streamed today, but it will be posted online as well if you want to forward it along. Um, and thank you.